whole lot of time uh, to House Bill 481. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Major Lee had, oh, you didn't. Uh, Representative Bursting. Yeah, you're the black market will always undercut legalized industries. How bad is your problem of dealing with the black market with alcohol? Because there is no black market competition for alcohol. There never has been. There never will be. You can grow marijuana in a plant with absolutely no, um, no chemical or plant experience. Uh, whipping up a, bat a batch of beer or alcohol or wine, that's a different story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, to House Bill 481, FN, a local relative to the legalization and regulation of cannabis and making appropriations there before. And I, oh, and I call, oh, so here you should know better, <laughs> Representative Red pushing the prime sponsor of the My bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Rennie Cushing here in support of House Bill 481, which um, I'm sure the members will recall passed the House by 209 <coughs> margin um, and also passed for the first time out of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. But I say the first time, first time that, the, that my committee has taken a position that we should make a, a change from prohibition to regulation, legalization, legalization, regulation, taxation of, of marijuana, of cannabis. Um, I'm aware that the, the focus of the committee is on the economics, the, the revenue, and the, um, the tax aspects of it. If you would, I can quickly walk you through the bill, those appropriate places, um, you know, on, sub, on uh, power, you know, section two, sets up a cannabis control fund. It's a uh, boilerplate special fund that takes place, that is established in the treasurer's office. On four, um, Mr. Pages, okay, yeah, page I'm sorry. I'm on page, on page one. On page one, uh, beginning at line 23, is where there's a application. It establishes a cannabis control fund, and simply says the money deposited in the control fund, is, which it, it, we should, yeah, this the treasurer will have control over this. Later on in the bill, where it sets up the regulation of cannabis, it uh, establishes a. A, a, a control fund. Um, the, the next portion, if you look on page two, oh, line. Um, Maybe you have questions now. Oh, yeah, if you want. On if, uh, if they relate to what he's just said. Yeah, yeah. relating to the fund, uh, our representative, what is the cost to operate that fund if there is one? And are there any, uh, you, you talk about yeah. the, the fines and penalties further program as the funding mechanism. That, that's fine, that's understood. Yeah. You do that all the time. I think you're going to come back. I'm, 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 back. I'm just saying that okay. this amends, you know, the, the, the long list of the statutes of, of uh, what funds are under jurisdiction control of the okay. treasurer. This just adds another one, and the fund itself gets established in another part. This is from kind of like the like yeah, treasurer's pussy. This is oil, right? yeah. Um, the other part on page two, on <coughs> line of um, line four, this amends the current statute, um, which has established a, a, a revolving fund that's a drug forfeiture fund, to add to the purposes for which it may be used the cost of collection of baseline data related to marijuana regulation. As I get into the the, the, the Large, the, the, the bill itself, one of the things that it does do is that it establishes um, a program by which baseline data related to marijuana will be collected by the Department of Health and Human Services. This simply amends the existing statute for drug forfeiture funds that allows monies to come from that. Um, then into the, 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 the next section sets up a regulation of cannabis program. The, a new chapter, 318F. And this is, <clears throat> if you go on to uh, page six, is the place where you have a first, um, first, I think, a reference to uh, revenue that possibly would come where it, uh, it defines on page, uh, on paragraph, on line nine on page six, 
that someone who violates the chapter shall, for a first offense, be subject to a fine of up to $1,000 in forfeiture of cannabis accessories. Um, that's I mean, part of the enforcement mechanism. Money comes in, I draw your attention to that. There's a, other places where earlier on consuming, there's, fines, there's a series of fines and penalties that are um, through this section uh, 318F3. F3. Um, I will move down There's uh, to the Cannabis Control Commission. I think that's what it was. This Cannabis Control Commission, uh, you know, it's established that, that the, 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 the chairperson shall be specified as RSA 941A and established by the Joint Committee on, on Employee Classifications pursuant to the normal procedures for that. Um, and it also, and it, that's for the chairperson, it provides that the uh, I think that there's two part-time commissioners who will we pay two hundred day or two hundred dollars a day or one hundred dollars for a half day. That's lifted. That's similar to what takes place in other uh, regulatory agencies that the bill is modeled on. Um, going further ahead on that, that that this section lays out all the performances and responsibilities of the Canvas Commission. This bill also sets up on page eight getting on line 35, <clears throat> a cannabis advisory board. This is an advisory board that's going to be set up that has 11 members that are going to um, study and make recommendations on the regulation and taxation of cannabis and cannabis products in New Hampshire. And I draw your attention to that because one of the questions that has been raised um, <clears throat> relates to what happens if they're, you know, how, do, how, do the tax, how does tax structure uh, get um, Get, both get set up and also how does, how does it change depending upon changing circumstances, uh, primarily anticipating possible changes in the federal regulatory statute. And it will be the charge <coughs> of this advisory commission every two years to take a look. Um, if you look at page 9 on 923, um, it requires that this, that this advisory committee will reevaluate the tax rate and method of taxation and make recommendations to the commission including recommendations for changes to tax rate and method of taxation once federal law allows interstate cannabis sales. Um, and it, it, that will be the mechanism by which kind of should there be, should there be need for changing in the, in the tax structure because of federal law or just because of how the program is operating in New Hampshire. That is the means by which uh, the, the commission, the Cannabis Control Commission, and ultimately this body, the legislature, will be able to do that. Just a second. I'm oh, sorry. Will the commission be setting the fees and tax rates, or will that have to come back to the legislature where it belongs? This this bill has the, the fees set by the legislature, okay. the tax rate. It does it. It's a, they they carry it out. I mean, there's some things. There's I, to skip ahead. There are um, there are provisions here to allow the commission to establish tiered licenses depending upon the size of the operation and within a range this statute allows them to make a decision but it's oh, okay. yeah. but that's in, on page 10 by putting it back to the legislature I yes. believe it would give more uh, force fighting uh, the federal law yes. because you have the state doing it not some bureaucratic agency yeah. no it, it does that the only it does that is and there are as, as we get to, there is a specific I mean, I guess I could get to the regular, I'll segue into the yeah. regulation of cannabis now, yeah. if, they, if you want. There are no, I'd, I'd rather you go through and you can avoid discussing okay. our policy. Um, just go through and give us yeah. everywhere. Well, where just, okay, that's a, well, then I move on to, I to the regulation of, of cannabis. And this is where it right gets. Away. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you break this into the fee part and then to the tax part. Yes. Right? So what you're saying with the fees, we have a range, I think I saw that in there, up to 10,000 yeah. for fees, and there's different licenses and all yes. that. So what you're saying is within that range, you're given the authority to, and the bill is given the authority to the Cannabis Commission to do that. Yes. Not the legislature. Yes. Well, but it will be through bit, Del Car. But through Del Car. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we'll get to the fees in a minute. Yes. We'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, this yeah. envisions... We'll talk about the, like, the, yeah. uh, the tax in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, let's just go through okay. and so, so so quickly, what, 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 you know, what, there's a couple things. One of the things that this stat, this, this legislation uh, uh, enables the Cannabis Control Commission to establish five licenses, one for cultivation, one for production, 
one for retail sales, one for transportation, and one for test and one for testing. And if they need, have additional needs, they have the authority. But those are the basic uh, licenses that they will be that they will be issuing. Um, and then on page 10, on five, on uh, line beginning on line three, there is a process by which someone um, makes an app makes an application to the commission for one of those licenses. And it, you know, it, it says that. It, the uh, the non-refundable portion will be not exceed one thousand dollars with a provision that can be an adjustment for uh, inflation for upper lakes. Um, that uh, there will be a, for the smallest tier of cultivation, it will not exceed two hundred. And when I say the small tier, the, you know, it may be like four plants in the backyard for the farmers market. I don't know that, but the, the idea is it sets up. It allows for three tiers based upon size. Uh, for the, for the commission to establish those those, those licenses, um, they will also go through a and again through um, through rulemaking. Um, it will include a schedule of fines for violations of the chapter and revenue uh, DRA rules. I mean, DRA rules concerning this. Um, when it and um, that you know then there's some yeah requirements that they can impose requirements that. Uh, cannabis establishment have shared management ownership or ownership with alternative treatment centers that they'll be able to regulate that and to parse out which um, are which uh, operations under a license are properly for an alternative treatment center and which ones are going to go to retail adult commercial sales. <coughs> there'll be uh, a fee. If you look to page 12 on line 30. That that's the uh, pre registration procedures for cannabis establishments. Um, one of the ways this is going to work is that every applicant that will apply both to the state but also uh, apply to uh, $500 fee will go to the local municipalities to review the application. Um, again, there's an exception that $75 in case of a small tier cultivation facilities. That's on line 33. Of page 12. Yeah, um, yeah. So that, that's 500 depending on no matter what cut the license for all. Uh, to operate a cannabis, yes. For except for the except manufacturer of edibles. That yes, would, this mm -hmm. goes to the local community. There's the tech, there's, there's a fee that I, I think I referenced earlier um, that can be up to uh, $10,000 for uh, you know, up to 10000 for. The various licenses, so the state state licenses, right? The state licenses for the local part, because this per, this allows for a local pop out. Uh, if you don't want to have, uh, if you don't want to have it in your, in any facilities, you can make. You don't have to have it. If you do, the first thing you do is when with the same time a license get, you apply for a license to the, the state, you also it goes to the local community to the, to that regulatory body. And it's five hundred dollars. It goes to regulatory the, the local community to review that. Um, uh, you know that's you know, that and, and that's you know that's basically it in terms of like how the licensing part will work. Um, then I know that you're interested, perhaps, um, in the, the taxation portion, and that if you turn to page 19, down uh, beginning at, at, at 77. What um, the, the, the tax method that's included in the bill as proposal is that it's thirty dollars an ounce for all cannabis flowers. I, I would note in states that have opted to tax on a per on a per ounce or on, on a weight measure. I believe New Jersey just proposed forty-two dollars an ounce. I know that the state of Alaska does, 50, I believe, fifty dollars an ounce. Um, we made a decision to go at the low end of the. Of the uh, range that the study commission that was headed by Representative Abrami uh, looked at, um, and that's where we came up with thirty ten dollars for parts of it, fifteen dollars for in immature plants, and then the tax would be imposed proportionately on quantities of less than an ounce. Um, and again, so the, the way this will work is that the tax will be uh, will be levied at the Transfer from the whole, from the, yeah, it'll be levied once on weight. It'll either be on, from the transfer from a a grower or a grower to a production facility, or a grower to a retail or a cultivation to a retail 
So that, that will be the, the taxation method. Then uh, once every, you know, on the 15th of each month, the facility that is either the cultivation facility will pay into the um, pay to the state, pay pay to the, pay to the uh, commission, um, the all the all the, the taxes, fees, and fines pursuant to the to the chapter that will be deposited in the cannabis control fund. Then, so the cannabis control fund is established, and uh, after deducting the cost of administration for the fund. Uh, every six months it will be dispersed as follows. There will be $50,000 that will go to the Department of Safety uh, Information Analysis Center. This is on page, uh, line 32 on, on page 20, uh, that will go for data collection reporting related to the health impacts of the cannabis production regulation. Of the remaining funds, 23% will go to the Department of Health and Human Services for use in evidence-based voluntary programs for the prevention and treatment of substance abuse. 20% will go to the municipalities based on the percent of all cannabis retail sales that took place in the community during the previous three months. And for cannabis delivered to customers, there will be a, a division of that revenue divided equally between the municipality where, it's, where it is, is the uh, sale is made and the municipality with the delivery. And on top of the 13% will go to municipalities where uh, there's a cultivation operation. The, 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 the part I referred to before, the 20% is based upon the retail sales. Um, then 5% will go to public safety agencies uh, for hiring, training, additional drug recognition experts, advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training, and assist in responding to drug problems. 6% will go to the Department of Health and Human Services um, for programs that are designed to medically enacted public education programs educating youth and adults of health and safety risk of alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and other substances. And then 33% will go to the general fund. <coughs> that's the, that's what Representative Brown, did you have? Yeah, it's, it's, we can just keep going and find places and then come back. I've got a lot of questions too. Oh, okay. well, I think he's up to you. Yeah. All right. Um, that, but that's 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 the that's the, the, the revenue collection method methodology and that's the kind of the broad overview of the proposed disbursement of the fund. Um, the appropriation for this particular bill is again there's the hundred thousand dollars which I believe it, it, in the bill says from shall come from funds not otherwise appropriated. It may be as again it may be able to come from the drug forfeiture fund, but that'll be a hundred thousand dollars for the uh, fiscal year to uh, collect the baseline data. Then this proposes $2 million for the next fiscal year to establish the Cannibal Control Commission. Um, um, where's that one again? This is on line 33 on page 25. And I know a lot of the, um, a lot of the components of the Cannabis Control Commission are guidance upon this came from the report that uh, the, the commission did that established kind of as a as a baseline what their what what there was what they what was assumed would be necessary for um, to establish uh, this cannabis control commission and the regulatory and taxation <coughs> scheme, which I can I can talk about uh, more, but. That is basically the kind of the broad overview of this bill. Thank you. Well, there's nothing in these repeals of things you've just passed that that um, affects any of the costs of revenue. Uh, not until the time they are repealed. There is one of the repeal. A lot of the repeals are uh, deal with some. Uh, the existing chapter. Some of it is uh, uh, prospective repeals that relate to the Cannabis Advisory Board. Um, uh, uh, so the notion is that by 20, um, I can't remember, by, by, by 2025, but the this should be up and running. The Cannabis Control Board is envisioned as something that will help get move it forward and then we'll See if it should be sunset or not. Some people like 
sunset on programs. So that's what we thought we could do. Okay. Can we start back through it now that we're seeing a little bit? Well, I just have one quick question. Rep. Sivori and then Rep. Um, the commissioner of the uh, cannabis control, mm -hmm. will that be called the high commissioner? Uh, <laughs> Representative Woolery, no more questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Edwards. Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> As, as you, you may not be surprised, I, I have probably 10 to 20 questions, and I hope yeah. that you appoint me to the subcommittee that looks into this because right. there are just a lot of questions. I, I wanna, I want, I'd like to ask uh, Representative uh, uh, Cushing uh, a, kind of a strategic question, and that is um, uh, you have engineered with great precision the revenues from the taxation and exactly where the expenses are going to go. It's really nice from an initial business model perspective, but what I'm concerned about overall, and I'm just curious how much thought went into the an alternative, so that once this program gets going, that it has the entrepreneurial flexibility to actually be a good, viable program. Like, just as an example of my concern is you've fixed the, we will, the legislature, you would have a legislature fix the tax rate and tax structure while it's, while somewhere in the report it says, let's not create a, a black market by taxing too much. And, and I don't know how we're going to have the entrepreneurial flexibility to achieve all the objectives that this program may have when government can't do business. So what is our alternative structure once this thing gets going? Well, if I might, I think that this provides a framework that will allow the flourishing of an entrepreneurial market-based group. Because what the, at least initially, our, our intent is in finding that price point that will drive out the black market. Right now, I think there's 100% tax on cannabis because it's all in the black market. Um, and that's a tax. That's a tax. And what we what we have tried to do in setting the the, the tax rate at 30 percent and in creating a series in creating tiered licenses to make sure that there's not barriers to entry, if you will, to this what we hope is a new emerging market. We tried to set it at a place that uh, will provide uh, a tax structure that will be incentivized people to use the, to go through the, the legal market and to have the black market disappear. Um, um, you can have a follow-up, but I, I do want to point out that uh, Representative Abrami's commission looked at, at this report. issue. Yeah, it's really good, and I'm, now I'm looking at the law, and I'm at, I want to ask some questions. I mean, I, so we did I, 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 think, I think I may have not phrased my question to you properly. Okay. I, I think the debate is generally over on whether or not we want to have a black market or not. I'm, I, I, I basically support the concept of this bill. I'm just worried that this is a government structure trying to run effectively a business based on statutory uh, costs and, and revenues, and I don't see the flexibility that would be needed to really keep this viable for three years to five years to ten years, or is there an alternative organizational structure to what's proposed here? Uh, thank you for your question. I, I think that one of the things about the advisory commission, and we set up a you know, we set up a structure that in many ways is, is similar to you know for Canada's control commission, the way that we deal with what with other previously proscribed. Uh, Social ills that we, similar to how alcohol is, is is controlled and regulated, similar to how gambling. We're looking for models of how we made a transition from a prohibited activity to one that's actually legalized and commercialized. So we we, we set up this this structure of a cannabis control commission. We set up an advisory commission that we hope will be uh, a dynamic, vibrant commission that will be able to take in and monitor this monitor changes and come up. I mean, I, there's nobody that believes that this is not going to be a dynamic process and change as, as we go 
forward. And I think Representative Abrami's, the commission that he studied, was one of the things that they learned is that every state has done it differently. This is, the, this is like quintessentially the laboratories of democracy working. We're, we're trying out this. This is a proposal that we put before the committee that we think makes sense for New Hampshire now. And certainly if you have other suggestions that we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to be going forward in this process for a while. I, I, I just want to intervene here on, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but we are dealing only with revenues and costs. And on the policy about the other stuff was settled in his committee. I, I think my question was exactly that. It was on revenues so, and costs so and how like to do that over time. would you like a variable structure for our tax? the tax we put in? I, I, I think for uh, this um, market, which it is, we're going to be entering a competitive marketplace as a state government, and I think unless we appreciate the entrepreneurial spirit that's needed to do that, we're going to give ourselves a bureaucratic methodology here that isn't going to adapt as rapidly as it should. I, I offer up the alternative treatment centers as an as a example of New Hampshire trying to get into business and having problems uh, being entrepreneurial enough. But, um, so I, I think my question was relevant and to the ways and means. I do not think that we are going to be able to put something in that says you can tax anywhere from 10 to $50 depending on what the market looks like. No. But yes, Representative Oler. I, I, I'm sorry, Representative Brownie was um, <coughs> first. So, um, on the, on the, where the money goes is a little different than with the norm for us. Um, with 20% 20, oh, 20 going to the municipalities that have stores, retail stores, and 13% going to, it looks like, uh, if you have a manufacturing site uh, or a grocery, <coughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, that's different. Um, alcohol doesn't work that way. Tobacco doesn't work that way. Uh, gambling doesn't work that way. Lottery doesn't work that way. But, 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 but so, so this is different. I mean, I, I see this more as a way of luring towns to actually have a store in their town because we're going to dangle some money in front of them. Is, is that, yeah. That's what it seems like to me. And I, it's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that that's what it appears. Yeah, I, I, I think that we recognize that they, there may be uh, you know, some impacts on a, on a local community and the communities ought to share in whatever benefits come from I think it's, I think it's you know, there was a time when Meals and Rooms, we used to, that, that there used to be, that, you know, if, if you were supportive of the hospitality industry in your community, you would get a, a, a little bit more money coming back from the Meals and Rooms taxes Absolutely. than we do right now. And, here. I'm just saying that this is a, uh, we're trying to be equitable, mm -hmm. trying to find that balance. Yes, but uh, yeah, I thought you were responding to, to that. So, yeah. so I've cut off the two other people that were going to respond to him. So, okay, Representative Olery, were you responding to Representative Edwards? Uh, partially because the state of New Hampshire is already engaged in uh, um, retail sales. Liquor is the primary example of that. Uh, the collection scheme, I think we probably should wait till the ERA comes up and uh, discusses the yes. tiered breakdown as to how it's going to go and what the cost is to administer that particular program. But I do uh, agree with Representative Cushing that it, the breakdown the way it is, some of it is an incentive in the same fashion that we provide an incentive to restaurants to keep a certain portion of meals rooms in order to collect a portion of meals and rooms, and some of it goes back to the town, perhaps not as much as it should, but some of it goes back to the town for their. Uh, so I, I think we already have a structure that's in place, and I think that uh, some mistakes were made with the uh, uh, medical marijuana yeah, this program. Is, this is discussion. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And but, I thought that the bill was allowing, I uh, was licensing retail establishments that we're going to figure out on their own how to sell rather than selling through state, state uh, stores. Oh, absolutely. No, there are no state stores involved. This is about, this is about licensing retail 
individual retail operator. Like a grocery store selling Like a grocery store, exactly, selling beer yeah. and wine, not no, that. Yes. 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 Uh, the, the report gave them two hours. We, we, we went through this with the Liquor Commission about whether we want to sell in state stores. It was, we had a long discussion about this. That went away pretty quick. And, and first off, Liquor, Liquor Commission doesn't want marijuana sold in their stores, although they were interested in being the, the agency that oversaw this. We chose to say, no, they're a business yeah. selling alcohol, let's let them do that. So this is part of the policy that this right. committee already decided. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, and, um, and, and that policy includes, you won't have both, be, we won't have both a liquor license and a cannabis license. Right, which is another yes. issue that we... Uh, no, I, I think Clarification, I from the else that Clarification from the chair. Clarification from the chair? Well, clarification. Yes, just as a clarification I know we're going to have a long time to discuss this amongst right. ourselves right. I'm concerned that we want to get information about revenue from all the people we do and yes. I know and we need to get through yeah. Thank you. With Rep representative Cushing first on um, we can't be discussing these things now we're trying to understand what it is <coughs> we can ask questions about what it is I have one. I have, I have related one or two more of the related questions. If, when you got okay, I'll represent first. I'll withdraw my thank you. That's Senator Bonnie. Okay. Um, uh, in the commission, we talked about uh, seed to sale tracking. Right. And uh, the Department They're of Revenue was there with seed member to sale. seed to sale thank tracking. You. And the Department of Revenue actually viewed that as a revenue issue more than anything and that's why we included it in the report most other states have seed to sale tracking to make sure there's no leakage of product at the grower sites off to the black market that, and from a purely from a revenue standpoint mm -hmm. you know we'd be losing revenue from taxing the, the product so i didn't see seed to sale in the, in the in the report unless i missed it no i the, the, i thank you for your question um, i think it's it, it's it's there in the authority for the Cannabis Control Commission. To in, in rules? For yes. them in rules? Yes. So I, I, you know, I went to a fine tooth comb, I couldn't find it. Right, yep. If you can help me out and uh, show yeah. me, not now, because it's gonna take a while. I, I realize that, I do know I do know there was a, the, the line that we believed was instructive to the, to the, to the Cannabis Control Commission by rules to provide for, a, a, you know, a seed to sale mechanism. Could, could you find the specific part for us later? And, yes, I will. And look, I will. We are going to we're going to discuss this in a general workshop with all the other groups <coughs> on Monday afternoon. And um, then, as you know, we are stuck in session for three days. And Friday morning, we're going to have a work. We're going to have a subcommittee working on this. On this. On this. That's right. And so Monday afternoon. Then and then you will you will know Monday afternoon who the subcommittee is, and it would be helpful to inform. Them. I have one more question. Yes. Really, really, really yes. the revenues. Representative uh, Cushing. Yes. Um, on page twenty, I guess it's page twenty. Um, right. Uh, line six. The department shall adjust rates annually to account for inflation and definition based on uh, the consumer price index. Right. So I think we're talking about the actual tax, aren't we? Is that what we're talking about there? Um, that's right. So again, yeah. is that, again, that's, I guess that's something that Ways and Means has to discuss. Yeah, well, we, we, we tend to. If we're doing anything with inflation, we have to specify what inflation we're talking about as DRA is pointing out. Yeah, I believe DRA has that in there. Yeah. Their notes. They will, they will be talking about it. All right. Uh, Representative Burstein wants his question back. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it speaks directly to what? Yeah. You need to hear from me. It, uh, thank you for introducing this bill. Um, the idea of a fixed tax versus a percentage tax. Um, first of all, if it were a percentage, perhaps it would it would remedy the problem of inflation and things like that. Additionally, to give more latitude to 
uh, the competitive environment, and make no mistake about it, we're going to be competing with our friends across the state borders. What's your thinking behind a fix, the $30 per ounce versus, let's say, 12% or 9% or a percentage metric? My personal thinking? Well, the, the, the thinking, thinking behind it. I mean, I recognize you can do it. there are a number of different ways you can collect revenue. This seemed to be simple. Right, but you opted to go with the fixed balance. I'd like to get the reasoning behind that. I think in part because it, it was pretty simple. It was, uh, and it was similar to what the, you know Alaska, had, what other jurisdictions have done. I don't. Do you have a You know, I, I don't have a. Personal. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, I'm not vested in personally in any. I'm, I'm told that, and I'm told that the RA is going to talk with us about this. Okay. So, um, reps and Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on page 20, uh, line 38, and then on the next page down to line 7, <coughs> there are um, uh, percentages of money, revenue that will go directly to municipalities for various reasons. Uh, if those municipalities are, have entities that sell cannabis. Um, for a town like, you know, Auburn, Chester, Sandown, uh, we just don't have a big commercial footprint to begin with, but our residents are going to, you know, make themselves, uh, you know, avail themselves as much as, you know, the next community, I'm sure. So why, is Auburn, Chester, and Sandown going to essentially be, um, I don't want to say discriminated, it's got too heavy a term, uh, but disadvantaged maybe to where they're not able to share in the revenue benefit that the rest of the state's getting when our residents are likely to be as, custom, as much customers as anyone. I would submit maybe that entrepreneurial spirit that you, that you spoke of would find root in Auburn, Chester, and, and your other communities under this, knowing full well that not only would they provide a service or a convenience to members of the community, but also would give me additional revenues to those towns. So the rest is a debate. Yeah, is, is this what you meant by delivery, which I did not understand? I'm sorry? For You're expecting delivery services from mm -hmm. these 10 on centers to to different towns rather than people coming and getting it themselves you talked about I on, it, it's in particularly in in there on page 21 right. line line three on um, you're dividing the revenue between the municipality where the cannabis establishment right. that made the sales located and the municipality where the delivery occurred. It would be like if, if there's a cannabis, if there's a cannabis bakery that's licensed as a production facility, that the, 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 the sale from the product of that, from that product to a retail establishment, that the, that the funds would be divided. So that is a retail delivery, it's not a customer. Point for the final point for you. So, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, President Cushing, uh, I don't think the bill, the, the bill will allow internet sales. Did you guys uh, talk about that at all? No, I mean, we were very mindful of wanting, we're very mindful of the coal memo. We're very mindful of, even when you talk about will it be interstate sales, we're very mindful well, of- Well, interstate we can't do. Huh? We, we, yeah, we just, definitely can't do. We are just internally here in, 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 in the state. I mean, I- But, but follow up is, but there are some stores in the state that would probably want to uh, sell over the internet to yeah. within New Hampshire. Has that been addressed in the bill, or can you reply? Not, we, we do not have a provision in the bill for interstate oh, so, Okay, that way, selling that way. You have to physically go to a store, or I guess you, you can you call a store. You have to go to a store, you have to have, show an ID, right. you, have to be, you have to be over 21 years of okay. age. We don't sell beer over the internet, I don't think. Maybe right. we do. Okay, I just wanted to make sure right. that. Thank you. I'm not sure we don't. Well, maybe, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, I, mean, I, I think one could, maybe, I don't think that you know, uh, Okay, <coughs> um, page 22, are there any other things we want to get 
clear about what the bill is doing that cannot be better answered by DRA or, or on. We also have agriculture and uh, safety coming up. And so, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. um, names. So in this bill, you, you opted for what I would call a wholesale tax, the $30 per ounce, um, and um, not for a retail-based tax, and that follows the recommendation of uh, the commission. Um, and I'm sure we'll be exploring that when we get in, into the weeds here, but uh, my question is whether that choice was processed any more than what we're going to we'll find in looking at the, uh, the report of the commission or in committee or in the course of making a recommendation to the legislature. Is there more that we can learn through I mean, you if, on what this? If you, if, 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 if there, the decision was made to follow the, the recommendation of the committee, and we set the price at the low range of $30, thinking that that would, you know, that would help drive out the bill. In our, in, in our criminal justice committee, we dealt with the policy of whether or not we should make the change from translation, knowing full well that we that we didn't we didn't quite we didn't discuss it at length, knowing that that's the domain of this committee. Good. Okay. Fine. I'm Representative Major. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was wondering if it's possible that you could generate a flow diagram that shows the <coughs> revenue generation uh, at the license time. Revenue generation at the wholesale and the revenue generation at the retail. That's how that comes together. I will, I myself might not, but I, I will try to find someone who will get that to the committee by Monday afternoon. Here, what session is that? I will do my I will do my best to try. We don't need it quite so much Monday afternoon since we'll be doing nine bills. Okay. Um, but we. Uh, by Tuesday would be nice. Glad to have it so during session. Again, I don't have the capacity to do it. I will try to find okay. we'll find see. someone to help. Part of that should be my question, which is um, you're allowing home growers for their own use. I yeah. think it's to have three mature plants or four. If they're going to have four plants in their backyard, you said, to sell at the farmer's market, um, you expect them to register at state level and at municipal level and pay a tax? I, I, no, I did not mean to say, I meant, when I said someone may want to grow a small plants in their backyard, I did not mean for personal use consumption. I yes. meant that if someone, if someone does want to have, a, someone wants to get into the lower tier level and wants to have a small, commercial plot. They will have to go and apply for a license. They will have to be ready to enter into, into commerce. The personal use is just simply for personal yes, use. Yes, if if it does enter into commerce, then there's no... I was trying tax. to distinguish them. Yes. So even for plants that you might be taking them off the farmer's market as part of your, your other small garden, you no, you can you, you you will not be entering into commerce with those plants that you grow for your own personal no, use. No, this isn't for your personal use. This is to take to the farmers yeah. market you will along get, with your carrots and your parsnips. Well, you will have to get a, a license from the Cannabis Control okay. Commission to sell the the, the 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 plants you take along with your carrots. And permission. And permission, from your because your that is a okay. regulated product, and Thank carrots you. are not. <coughs> There's a whole there's a section in the bill on hemp. Yes. Um, and I don't I don't I don't think you're taxing hemp here. Or no. Okay. Can you just touch on that? I would just say something. It is possible. We there is another piece. There is a a bill that deals with hemp. There's been a change <coughs> in national hemp policy when the farm bill was passed in in December. There's a bill over environment and agriculture that deals with the hemp section. I, it, is, it would be my, my, I would suspect that by the time this bill finally wends its way through the legislative process, there may be reasons to have the hemp park disappear. But it was in the original bill with the intent to have it be kind of a comprehensive look at the time. At the time, 
uh, federal law can consider marijuana and hemp uh, both as under Schedule One drugs. So that's but the situation. Again, real quick. Yeah. So no tax issues related to that. No so tax issues. You shouldn't even worry about it. Okay. There were never any tax issues. But you were saying that um, we should make somebody needs to make sure that it might be only after it gets to the Senate yes. that the hemp section will be removed. If yes. the other bill yes. is making it through. We will be taking because up. Because this wouldn't be as good as the one the environment and agriculture. Yeah, obviously. And then within the and, and there's coordination between there are the shared sponsorship between this bill and also the hemp bill with Thank Representative O'Connor. We're tracking that. Representative Burns. Thank you. Um, if this is being taxed on the wholesale level at thirty dollars per ounce, how does uh, how do derivatives of marijuana get taxed? Do, do, do you have to take that marijuana post? You know, like okay, there's a there's a twenty ounces of marijuana that we taxed at thirty dollars an ounce. Now let's take that and extract these oils and then make candy. Yes. So it all has to take place in New Hampshire. We, yes. we can't be buying oil from somewhere else. Or? We this is strictly activity that takes place in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah, I, I alluded. There's a coal memo. There's a federal. The memo that the federal government has said: if you comport with these conditions, we will leave the states alone. And fundamentally, seed to sales laws. But fundamentally, you keep track. You do not let it go into interstate commerce. Okay. Okay. That whole memo is from the Obama administration, and no, that's been the Senate, but the Senate, but the, the sessions memo, but the new, the new, the new uh, Attorney General, yeah. in his and when he was being uh, before Senate, said he could probably revert. His thinking was to revert back to the Cole memo. Uh -huh. is, is what I remember. Yeah, that's, that's so, But what, can I just clarify one thing? So I'm, I'm here. Um, just help me out here. Uh, a couple of people have been referring to wholesalers. I don't think the bill talks about wholesalers. Or, or the whole, I, if we talk about we talk about the four licenses are cultivators. cultivators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So w it's going to be taxed at the cultivator level, not the wholesaler. I don't, I don't think the, and the, the, the cultivators are going to be selling to either the manufacturers or to the, uh, the retail directly. So that's how that that works. So, so, so the person who is going to make the extract will buy it. From the cultivator, I guess that would be false, but that's where they get it. And that's where the tax goes. But there's not a subsequent tax on. Okay. No. Dumb I just have one very quick follow-up on another unrelated issue. It's have we ever resolved the banking problem with cash um, in the marijuana industry, where they can take their cash and deposit it in a bank, or is that still up in the air? That is still under um, the session at the federal government level. I do know that obviously that there are some ways that uh, people are working with cannabis on a not strictly cash basis. I think in Oryx, state, they've used state credit unions as a way that people have gotten out of it. But for the most part, we're waiting on the federal government to deal with the cash issue. And we do have someone from the Banking Association right. here who is not putting a pink card. That's right. Okay. And I know the representative of Rami, I mean, his yes. commission has extensive discussions on it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so now um, I want to go next to um, um, the DRA because that's what we're mostly concerned with and I want it laid out so other people can then talk. I hope everyone noticed the sign. Uh, signs out there that said uh, we are only talking revenues and costs. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Carolyn Lear. I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue, and with me is Melissa Rowland. She's a Senior Financial Analyst um, with the Department of Revenue. And we are here to talk about revenues and taxes, so that's perfect. Um, so I believe you have all received a fiscal note quick guide from the department. I'm going to be primarily working from that document, so if anyone doesn't have one, I have some extra notes. Thank you. 
And in that document, so in that document, I'm actually going to start um, on page three um, and just hit some quick items, and then I'll sort of hand it over to Melissa to talk about the good stuff, like revenues. So you'll note in, on page three, starting towards the bottom, we list a number of what I would consider to be quite small but important technical defects. Um, I'm not gonna go through them in detail because you have them before you, but I would like to talk about the um, very last technical defect on page four. So, um, <clears throat> This was discussed before the commission, um, but it's really sort of a small, but I imagine important issue to some folks, which is that federally, um, as you know, the sale of marijuana is illegal. And as a result, the Internal Revenue Code treats folks who engage in that activity as a business differently. Um, the primary, primary difference being that if you're selling marijuana um, legally at the state level, you're still required to file a tax return, but you're not permitted to deduct, to deduct, um, excuse me, to deduct your costs of doing business like every other business is permitted to do. This essentially um, converts the federal corporate income tax from a um, net income tax to a gross income tax. And um, as you are all well aware of, New Hampshire uses the Internal Revenue Code as a starting point uh, for the calculation of the business profits tax. Uh, what you see in other states who have legalized is that they make the appropriate modifications to their state business tax to allow what is a state level legal business to deduct their ordinary costs um, of doing business in the state if the state has chosen to legalize that activity. If you choose to legalize, that may be something that this um, committee would like to consider as well. Are so you staging this in this document? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's the very last mm -hmm. paragraph um, um, in our document. Mm -hmm. And the solution to that would be to, uh, to put into our code only for, <coughs> for people licensed under this on um, bill on um, all uh, their ability to deduct all of their ordinary and necessary business expenses. That's great. How many pages of the federal code is that? It's only it's only one statutory provision. We cite it here. It's section 280 <coughs> of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so I think you could probably do it pretty by swiftly reference. by Very referencing yes. that Good. provision. Thank you. I, I had a question about uh, the paragraph before that, which I labeled out. Uh, what are you going to do about uh, that? That is in reference to divvying up the profits <coughs> of the tax among among different places. Um, have you got any thoughts for that that you're going to share with the work yeah. session later? I think it could uh, very easily be solved by um, making an exemption in our confidentiality, confidentiality provision that states that um, the amount of revenue collected um, by any in any municipality isn't confidential information. Thank you. And would that um, open up <coughs> anyone since then that would be public information to federal? It would be anyway because they have to mm -hmm. the income tax. Yeah, that's true. That's right. And we have sharing yeah. agreements with the federal government. <coughs> Thank you. Madam yeah, Chair? Yes. Regarding that, the follow up on the Chairman's comments as to the uh, exemption was required here, um, Representative Cushing laid out uh, a nightmare line and, and talked to uh, um, the eyesight to, uh, to uh, Norm. Uh, Representative Major, that flow sheet could be done, and what would be the cost to the DRA to <coughs> do all that dividing? Or would that be something that could just be done uh, by a computer going, here's it is, here's here, data in, data out, done? I'll have to ask the 
to admit I'm a little <coughs> lost um, with that question. I took uh, oh, represent <laughs> I took Representative Major's question to be relative to the breakdown of um, revenues from the various licensing versus taxation sources. Yes. Yeah. Um, that exercise, I, I would think, would be somewhat um, simple. I would just note that this um, this draft of the legislation does not have the Department of Revenue collecting the license fees because there's this can cannabis control board that does the vast majority of the licensing and regulation. So we wouldn't have that data to um, give. Oh, well, Madam Chair. Yes. Would that then be a duplication of effort between the cannabis board and the DRA? And would it be more uh, efficient for the state to take the tax collection function like you do with some tobacco products, et cetera, and move it over to your agency while leaving the entire <coughs> enforcement to the board? Enforcement inspection over here, tax collection <coughs> with the tax collectors. Who's that strange? So I'm, I'm not sure that I can um, affirmatively answer that question, um, only to say that I did sit through um, the commission's work, and I think the ultimate thought was because the department has sort of the auditors and the collections officers um, and the mail openers and all of the folks that have to process return documents for other types of taxes already, that there might be some efficiencies with locating the tax collecting function with us, but I don't. We don't have a position on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with regards to that second to last defect, which there was a recommendation taking the approach used in meals and rooms tax allocation, and that, that touches on a clear concern I have that I wanted to ask you about with. Revenue relating to meals and rooms tax revenue, for example, doesn't matter what it says in the statute. It can say 40%, 100% will go back to towns, but that's not what happens. What happens is the budget determines everything. Could this bill be subject to those same forces where municipalities expect 30%, but they get what the budget says they're going to get, and, and that could reduce over time? That question's above my pay grade. But it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it happened before, that that happens routinely in the legislature. Unless well, there is a constitutional amendment. Yes. That, that guarantees yes. it is rateable. <laughs> well, a different way of saying it is that it's, uh, the law is the law, and the law is affected by uh, amendments, and basically the budget can amend whatever is in this statute. Yes. Uh, Representative Major and then Representative Edwards. What the legislator gives, the legislator can take away. <laughs> okay, Representative Edwards. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you, you've noticed there's a potential uh, technical defect that we're using uh, the consumer price index to adjust tax rates. And as I understand the consumer price index, it's a federal model that factors in the cost of a basket of goods and probably does not factor in the cost to, cons to the consumer for cannabis. So we would be using an index that has nothing to do with cannabis costs to adjust cannabis taxes. I'm wondering, do you know of a better, different index that's more, that would actually measure what we're trying to measure? So I'll just clarify, our technical defect here is not that the consumer price <coughs> index is being used, but that the legislation hasn't been specific enough. I, I wanted to read this. That, that being said, I'm not aware of um, another source that you could use. Yeah. Right. I think the question is whether it should be a tax or an excise tax. And that's a question to discuss with the Senate of Congress. Well, well, I think they're going to touch on um, we, we looked at it both ways. And you guys will touch on So if we're um, done with the technical defect section, I'll move along to um, what starts <coughs> on page three of our document, the expenditure side of our analysis. Um, so what you have here is a very, very rough estimate of what we think it would take the department to administer a, a new tax on legal marijuana. Um, you'll notice that we've estimated 
$2 million to in implement changes <coughs> to our tax system. Um, as some of you know, we're at the very beginning stages of implementing a very large capital project to implement a new technology system to administer taxes um, as a result of a large capital appropriation um, during the last budget. Um, because of that, uh, we don't have, um, we're going to have to require that vendor to build, you know, an add-on to the system that they've already quoted us to administer taxes. Um, this vendor, Fast Enterprises, built the system for Massachusetts when they legalized. So they, they have something that they could use um, and sort of mold and fit to New Hampshire's decision, but it would incur a cost that we've roughly estimated at $2 million, which does take into consideration the scale of New Hampshire versus the scale of Massachusetts. Um, and that figure also includes some other smaller end operational changes that the department would have to make, like being prepared to accept large um, quantities of cash. Uh, we don't, we rarely, if ever, receive cash um, at the Department of Revenue. So we would have to make some changes, armored <coughs> cars, running machines, um, locked rooms, that sort of thing, to administer um, a somewhat cash-based um, tax. Going to- Could I ask about that? You don't include some kind of security person? Wouldn't that be required in your safe room? So, my understanding is that states have managed this issue in a couple of different ways. Um, I think a security guard would certainly be an option, but I think they've also established creative ways, um, like having individuals drop the cash at a location not near the Department of Revenue at a particular time that is randomized um, to, to sort of avoid the risk of someone, you know, being uh, stolen from or that sort of thing. So. Yes. So, in the commission, we recognize the startup costs, and I just can't remember what the range. So we gave a range of dollars. The bill calls calls for two million dollars an appropriation in the first year for the commission to get going, to get licensing going, and all that. Now, what you're telling us, though, is on your side that two million alone is needed to get to buy a, a license to get the software in place to be able to properly tax. Is that what you're saying? Here? Yeah. yeah, that is what I'm saying. I think it's a bit of a tough timeline because we were um, with you during the commission over the summer, and we had a contract and had a vendor in our um, offices in November. So we sort of were able to sort of probe them a little more closely once they were in-house to sort of say, what would additional taxes cost? Um, so we didn't have great information at the time the commission was operating. Yeah, but uh, I'm more in general, that's fine. Yeah. That Madam Chair, Paul. Yes. So there what we're saying- There is more than that in the two million. There is the safe rooms and the <coughs> armored cars and the cash counting machines. Right, it's that something that, in a way, it's finances issue, but this is not going to finance. No. But the, the appropriation, the appropriation of two million may not be enough. Is all I'm getting at. Yeah. To be to be able to get the startup going the way it should. That's what it appears to me. But we'll talk about that yeah. later. And it's not just the license; it's um, revising the software for our bill for our law. So okay. So I know that uh, co the committee seems interested in this issue of a retail sales tax versus an excise tax. And I can speak to that briefly as it relates to our administration of the tax. Um, I, I think that as was acknowledged, um, it was a recommendation of the committee, I believe, to have um, an excise tax as opposed to a retail sales tax. And I think the Department of Revenue did influence that conversation somewhat with the committee. Um, I think one of the things that we um, discussed with the committee was the cost to administer the tax and that that cost would be lower for an excise tax at the cultivator um, <coughs> level as opposed to a retail sales tax, just because simply you're going to have fewer transactions <coughs> to monitor and audit. 
you're probably going to have fewer taxpayers sending you in returns. And when you go to the audit, you're going to have to audit fewer transactions. So the cost to administer um, an excise tax at the, uh, the cultivator level is slightly lower. And probably you get higher voluntary compliance as well. I think the other thing the committee discussed um, was the issue of price fluctuation and that a flat tax um, would likely insulate the state from price fluctuations somewhat as compared to a retail sales tax. And I think there's costs and benefits to that, right? You miss the upside if prices go through the roof, but you also are protected somewhat from the downside if prices dive. So I think that's sort of a policy decision that you have to make. I, I wanted to just clarify, I, I used the wrong word. Because I was thinking of sales tax, I was thinking of percentage. Uh, but you could levy a percentage on the, the grower, they call it. And I think the price fluctuation issue still exists, as long as it's based as a percentage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so another another downside, isn't it, of, of a price decline with a fixed tax is that as a result of that, keeping that fixed cost higher, it's, sti it's more stimulative to a black market. Mm -hmm. It isn't just that we are overtaxing, it's that we're also enhancing the black market. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't speak to what the impact would be on the black market, but certainly the tax would be a higher proportion of the overall cost of the product. Uh, Representative Burns, thank you. <coughs> thank you for my question. Um, I want to go back to this cash. Uh, every month or whatever, however often this is paid, this boatload of cash comes into your place, you stick it in the locked room. And then the law says, it says on page four here that every six months you've got to then disperse to the muni municipalities. Municipalities also are not used to collecting, you know, getting a, an armory car pulling up, <clears throat> pulling up and giving them a pallet full of cash. Um, but is at some point, does that cash turn into, you know, legitimate money? Like what's the municipality gets it and they stick it in their bank account? My understanding, and my assumption is that other states, once they get that cash money, they're able to deposit it into their account and engage in electronic transfers. Um, we did not hear from any other state on the commission that they were retaining that payment in cash form indefinitely. Okay, so once the state gets the money, then it's okay to use the banking system. Thank you. Or at least that's what other states seem to be doing. More around this collaborate. Yes. So, but we heard from it. And we're going to hear from banking, and maybe you know, we're going to find out talk. But the member on the commission that that was a banker, or bank from the banking commission, said that he he really doesn't think that New Hampshire banks are going to touch this money as long as it's federally uh, illegal. So, which leads us to the cash issue, and other states have this problem. They, they come in, they pay, they pay taxes in cash, and some of these other states have counting machines. That, that's another expense you have to buy all these cash counting machines, and so forth, so on. Yeah, it's in one. Right. So, um, all right. I just wanted to clarify for the, the but yeah. But what she's saying is that in other states, when the cash has come in to the taxing authority, yeah, the I taxing agree. authority can then yes, they deposit can it normally. Yes, yeah. yes. <coughs> Thank you, Representative Tucker. Yes, uh, if you have the uh, cultivators pay the tax, isn't there going to be a longer lag before they're able to pay it? They won't have any cash flow? That rather than the retail, is, how do you see that happening? I, I understand in rooms and meals, most everybody pays, but some do fall behind, and that's a problem. And, and so, how does that work with this particular crop? Well, it's if you fall, but if people fall behind in paying the state what they owe, it's paid on the transfer. So it's not paid when you know it's picked. It's paid when it's transferred to the next individual or company in the chain of um, 
of commerce. So there's dollars passing at that point. So that's where the, the money from which you pay the tax would come. Um, I think, but the, I think the issue is no different than with an M&R taxpayer, that if the taxpayer does fall behind, um, it becomes very difficult for them to come up with the dollars right. to pay. But that's sort of an ordinary tax compliance issue that we encounter with all of our taxes. Uh, so this is nothing yeah. unusual. Thank you. Do, do you have more that you want to say to share? With you? I was ready to hand it over to Melissa to talk over the revenue estimate that we um, created if that's in, of interest. Um, could I ask before that the bill leaves it to you to distribute the money? Could you talk about that? So I think the, the bill has um, the department accepting the dollars that other agencies um, collect. For example, the Cannabis Control Board would um, accept the licensing fees, but it doesn't really um, direct how the Cannabis Control Board gets those dollars to us. Um, and so I think there's a somewhat easily solvable issue if the committee does believe that it's the right thing to do to um, get those dollars to us. But alternatively, you might just have the Cannabis Control Board transfer those dollars um, directly. Uh, the state, with respect to the meals and rentals tax, currently has those dollars go to Treasury for distribution. That might be the, the better mechanism to have the Department of Revenue send its dollars to Treasury, have the Cannabis Control Board send its dollars to Treasury, and then have Treasury parse out that revenue to the appropriate sources. I think they're the best equipped to do that currently. Thank you. Um, if you go to page two of the Fiscal Note Quick Guide, we have um, sort of the graph, the chart of the revenues. I'm going to hit how we did it, some of the assumptions, and then I'll go through that line by line, but I'll try to keep it brief as well. So as you know, it's the legalization of cannabis for 21 and older. It's $30 per ounce on all cannabis flowers, $10 for an ounce on other parts, and then $15 for immature cannabis. We have no way of determining the amount of cannabis items that will be sold or transferred to retail or cannabis product manufacturing facilities. But we did calculate this based on some assumptions and we used um, a New York methodology that came from the commission. We did the same sort of exercise for the commission. Um, we used New Hampshire population by age group. One assumption there is that the breakdown is for 20 and up. We can't sort of drill down into 21 year olds and older. So we're expanded the population a little bit there if it's 20 and up what's used in our population. Um, the percentage of population using cannabis in the past year and then the number of ounces of cannabis consumed which also came from the New York methodology which came from a series of studies. Some of the assumptions that we needed to use was that every, um, that we estimated the consumption on the $30 per ounce, the high end because we have no way of breaking out how much would be per flower, per the other parts or per immature, but we could do a similar exercise if you wanted something different, but for this analysis, it's all at $30 per ounce. Um, so that's probably overstated on that part. We also assumed in this that the number of um, residents using cannabis, that would they would all go from black market to legal market, so that may be a high estimate. However, I did want to note the, the, for the people that are using the cannabis that is coming from a substance abuse and mental health survey. So I'm sure that's not capturing everybody in the state of New Hampshire that's using it. So although that number may be overstated because they may, some of them may stay in the black market, we may not have captured everybody who is using the state of New Hampshire. So that's sort of our assumption. So it's a Thank you. I think I heard you just say that your assumption was that the number of people that would leave the black market to go legal would be smaller. Wouldn't it also be a good assumption to think that once this is legal, people who don't smoke at all, that aren't in the black market, will begin to consume? It seems to me like there is a, a, a I don't want to say higher range for fear of puns, but it seems like there's a larger number that we should be factoring in here. 
I think that's a, excuse me, fair assessment. It's hard to pick or know which way that goes. Whether this is over inclusive and the other one is under inclusive and where okay. that middle ground is. It's just great that we understand this. So. Yeah. 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 I think you could increase that or decrease it however you guys decide, but we could run that. So. Is there information in the, uh, in your report to the states? Uh, I forget to say I've had it for several months. About what? About on um, how much of the black market gets absorbed in, in third not, not really. low tax states. I don't think states. we really have any. We can address that question. <coughs> well, other than every state told us that we, we, all, we spoke to eight states, the eight states that are legalized at that point, that, uh, and, and not choice, that um, don't overtax it because then the black market never goes away. Right. That's the message. Yeah. And by the, we picked a number that was um, low, low in the medium, um, the thirty dollars an ounce. So I don't think the bill will over. Okay. It's gone to the over. Yeah. Okay, Representative Lockman. Thank you, Madam Chair. The tourism factor in this table here, just at a glance, seems low. So we used this again from the new methodology. <coughs> um, they had a whole formula. It looks at how many hotel rooms are in the state. It uses an 80% occupancy. It then uses um, adults occupied per room at 1.5%. And then it breaks it further down into just travelers, domestic travelers, sort of leaves those out so people that are already in the state that might have already been accounted for. It then takes interstate travelers and applies a rate. Um, and then it takes foreign travelers and applies another rate. So that's strictly based on New York's methodology. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of numbers in there. And is New York surrounded as we now are by marijuana states? So there's no advantage in coming here for that purpose. Um, but then, okay. no. I would say that that point is applicable <coughs> to any time you're looking at another state's revenue estimates to base our revenue estimates on. Because the most established um, marijuana states are in the western part of the country and they are islands so they're going to have very different tourism factors or cross-border sales than what New Hampshire is going to see um, in the New England region um, with the one caveat that rate can impact that right if, even if everyone taxes marijuana in New Hampshire if we're the lowest we still might see sort of an uptick as a result of cross-border sales, which I'm in no way advocating for or not, but I think it's relevant for purposes of trying to come up with an estimate of the revenue. Um, and we see that the cigarette sales, right, in New Hampshire is the, the lowest, so we get a lot of cross-border sales. I'm sure. I, I, just wanna, I just wanna ask you both uh, directly about the seed to sale and how, how, what level of importance you put on that. If, if, do we do have seed to sale from a revenue standpoint? So I think it's really an audit tool. Um, the way that businesses successfully um, avoid taxes, or one way that businesses successfully avoid taxes, is by keeping transactions off their books. You know, cash transactions, under the table transactions. And so a seed to sale system would make that very difficult because every seed would be tracked from <coughs> planting it in the ground to final sale. Um, and if um, unaccounted for um, items were missing, that would be a red flag from an audit perspective. Thank you. Uh, remember, it is 11.30, and we've got a lot of <laughs> you will be on your side. That means you can't be on some of the others. Uh, so, uh, then thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again next Friday at least. Somebody. Uh, I call the uh, Honorable Joe Hannon of Lee, New Hampshire, who is a public member of the Commission to Study the uh, Legalization of Taxation in Marijuana, uh, supporting the bill.
seen a lot of evidence in Europe that it's had many, many increases in alcohol tax that that has actually led to more increase in bootlegging alcohol in Europe. So they've recently, in the last few years, tried to lower their taxes a little bit. Uh, I think we should be very cautious and use those uh, as, as examples of what not to do. The other thing is, uh, you know, people worry about uh, how long it's going to take to get rid of the black market. It's going to take time. After prohibition of alcohol was repealed, it didn't happen overnight. It took a long time for it to occur. Uh, right now, I don't know anybody who complains about bootlegging alcohol being a big problem in New Hampshire. It probably does occur. I, you can talk to law enforcement about it, but it's not even an issue that comes up. Um, so, you know, is it going to happen? Absolutely. Um, what we've also discussed was, uh, you know, what hasn't been mentioned is there's also something called the gray market, which is not uh, an, an, a direct illicit market. It's when things are diverted from the, the, the legal market to uh, another non-taxable market. If the taxes are too high, you're going to have increased risk of that happening. Uh, it's still going to happen until you get rid of um, the black market. But you've also seen the largest increase in users of medical cannabis in uh, the the elderly population. And I use elderly as a general term. Uh, you know, it's older than me. Uh, but <laughs> basically, sorry. Um, that, that's the number one in, number one increased demographic. So no, you should be. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. They, and the reason why that, that I've heard from most people I've spoken with is that now that it's not illegal, they're more likely to use, uh, to use it from, an, from a legal source for medical purposes. And I don't see that changing a lot uh, with, uh, with adult usage. The, the big thing you're going to have to consider is, you know, will, in, will uh, you were mentioning how you're going to have new users who might not have used it in the legal market. That will happen, as did happen after prohibition was repealed. Uh, during alcohol prohibition, we did see um, a slight decrease in the numbers of people that were actually consuming, but the concentrations and the amount of alcohol that the people who were consuming got much stronger and higher. So, you know, we didn't have a lot of these higher concentrations, and I don't want to get too much into that because that is just ways it means, but um, I think having a more a legal market will make it uh, easier for people to consume more responsibly, safer. And even if they choose to uh, to enter the legal market, um, you know, we didn't see a rush of like everyone in the country going to start drinking heavily after prohibition was repealed for alcohol. There was a there was a bump. It came back to you know much more reasonable levels in a few years. So you're going to see a slight increase in the beginning, um, and the increase could be attributable to just people being more honest about their use. Uh, obviously, the surveys are subjective. Uh, not everyone's going to admit to their use. You ask someone if they use marijuana, everyone raise your hand if you use marijuana. <laughs> it's not a lot of people, but the statistics show that the numbers are no far one higher. No one on the committee raised their hand for the record show, but the numbers we know are far higher. Um, you know, not in ways and means. Not in ways and means. I don't mean to imply anything. But um, so that's, that's that point. And also, uh, real briefly about the allocation of where the money is going to go. Um, I, I do a lot of work with uh, substance use uh, treatment groups and uh, recovery centers and things like that. Um, you know, there were a lot of the concerns that were brought up in the commission, I think, are addressed here, where the money needs to go for enforcement, for tracking, for, um, uh, you know, money for the municipalities was also a concern. But uh, I think it's even better than what we have now. Right now, with, you know, not right now, but in the recent past, the alcohol fund made only 5% of that money for prevention, treatment, and recovery services. This is a much better number. Uh, personally, I'd like to see the number really high, but I know that this is, I'm not the only interest in this, and I think it's well represented amongst the various interests, so I think it's a very equitable and uh, comprehensive list of uh, groups that the money will be allocated to. Um, last thing is, uh, I know you asked uh, Representative Cushing about the authority for the commissioner to set up, um, um, I was the, um, sorry, 
C to sale uh, tracking. And if you turn to page seven, this may be it, I could be wrong, but uh, page seven, uh, line six, section C. Chairperson of the commission shall lead the administration of the commission and oversee the licensing and regulation of cannabis and hemp with guidance from the commissioners. So it's a very broad statement. They allow the commissioner and the commissioners to, <coughs> to regulate it. Uh, they could easily imply this through rule and, and put something like this in through rules. And uh, I think it's better to leave a lot of this micromanaging up to the commission, the people that are studying it on a more regular basis. As far as uh, the, the legislature reacting to the tax uh, changes in the consumer price index, Ideally, it would be great if they could set their own rates and say, okay, it's too much money, we're going to lower our own taxes, but they don't let anybody do that, obviously. Um, I think the compromise of allowing the legislature to do it is, is a decent one. It would be better, in my mind, if the commission could do it quicker through rules, but that doesn't happen in any other area of taxation, so I, I believe that this is the wise approach to take at this point. I'll take any questions. We're not. Representative Edwards, do remember all of these people want to be heard and, and we it's a, also... It's a yeah. quick one and a new one. Uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if, if somebody from Chester is an occasional weekend uh, smoker, is their name going to be tracked in any computer system so that their identity could be exposed? No. It's credited by them. No? All right. So this is actually for people that are concerned about that policy implication of whether your name is going to be on a registry or a list somewhere. This is actually less intrusive from a, a, you know, a liberty standpoint and for um, from that than, than what we have now with the medical cannabis bill where you have to have a card. You don't need a card, you just have to present your ID. Thank you. It has to do with just speaking to page 799. The commission may hire and terminate such staff. There, there's zero constraints on that. Do you think it might be wise to uh, have zero constraints or? Uh, um, that, that is committee policy, the first committee policy. Unless, does this relate to revenue somehow? Well, it would relate to expenses. It would relate to expenses of raising the revenues. I mean, it, I see it as germane to the tax. I, I think it would go back to the flexibility question. If they're, you know, it's a very new program. Uh, I know the commission, when we did our research, uh, we didn't recommend a big, you know, uh, recommend this as a major revenue source for the state. So that's why we only see a, you know, percentage, like 30 some percent go to general funds. But uh, if someone, if they do need more staff, I think it should be up to them. I think most uh, commissions and departments are allowed to, to determine where their money is spent. Uh, if they only have a certain amount now, they can hire 100 people, but obviously I don't think in this state with 400 legislators in the House and, and 24 in the Senate, we're going to have that goal on for very long. I'm sure there'll be a bill in very shortly to put an end to that and not reappoint the commissioner. So we have checks and balances for that, I believe. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. The next bill is Kate Fry. Um, for new futures opposing the bill with a handout and she has promised she is only going to be talking about revenues. Good morning, still <laughs> members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Kate Fry. I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at New Futures. Yeah, and then you're handing the handout out afterwards? Whatever you prefer. Um, I've just been asked for it. Sure. So. It's my written testimony as well as some articles that I will be referring to. So New Futures is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We educate, advocate, and collaborate um, to improve the health and wellness of New Hampshire residents through policy change. We work extensively with policymakers, stakeholders, and prevention partners to prevent and reduce alcohol problems in our state. We strongly oppose there health enough companies. Are there some coming around? Oh. There were twenty. 
House Bill 41 because it's irresponsible legislation that does not protect our health and wellness of our children. While there are several problematic policy aspects of the bill that was passed out of criminal justice unamended, I will focus my comments today on the flaws of the bill related to revenue estimates and protection. I'm not reading it, I'm just doing, I'm doing highlights from it. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what a lot of you had questions about. I think it it is something that's a very complicated issue, and I think you all have very good questions. I do want to point out that there, you know, this is a relatively new experiment. When we talk about Colorado, it's really only been five or six years. When we talk about markets like tobacco and alcohol, we have 30, 50 years when we talk about regulation and research and all of that. So there's a lot that we've learned. Uh, if you look at the study commission report, it does talk a lot about how there's quite a bit of volatility um, to the market nationally. And it really depends for those states that have legalized, um, which can depend on the type of quality, surrounding markets, demand, supply, and oversupply. And that has impacted the price of, legal, of marijuana. As we heard, some states overestimated revenue initially because they couldn't really account for the time it took to put together a program. Um, other states, the initial tax, as discussed, was set too high and that had to be adjusted to account for trying to move um, consumers to a legal market. Um, I do think that it's really interesting to point out, too, that the, the price has begun to plummet in western states where we've seen more established legal programs. Um, in Colorado, uh, the average price for a pound of high, very high potency cannabis at a wholesale level declined 58% from uh, January 2014 to July 2018. And in Washington as well, they've begun to see percentages, uh, they've begun to see falling prices. However, uh, the potency of those products, waxes, dabs, shatters, continue to rise on a legal market. Uh, wax and staff shatters are all things that would be included in House Bill 481, very high potency products. Because of this tax, a lot of uh, experts who have experts in legal marijuana have started to say it might make sense to move away from taxing <coughs> by the price and look at taxing on potency. Um, so these are all things that the committee should consider. Um, even, I think it's such an evolving um, area that even this information during the study committee really wasn't offered until we really started to learn what was happening um, with other states. A lot of experts are kind of retooling how it should be done. Um, I will say, and I won't read this, but uh, you know, the, uh, the assumption that it will eliminate the black market, um, that has not been the case in um, uh, legal markets, you will see that from um, page two when I talk about uh, still black market in Colorado and Oregon, and most recently in California has talked about because of a fragmented or uncoordinated enforcement in the state, the black market continues to flourish and actually take away, uh, threatens the licensed businesses. And they've had to actually divert a lot more law enforcement to that, and so the revenue they expected um, is hasn't accounted for that. Um, you heard from uh, the Department of Revenue uh, Administration, and you know they uh, laid it out very well. But they also said that it's very difficult to estimate this. I think that the assumption that all current users would move from the illegal market to the legal market is quite an assumption. Um, but it, you have to keep in mind this bill also allows up to 12 um, plants to be grown for personal use. That's untaxed. Um, product. So it's not really a, you know, um, an assurance that people won't just use what they grow and not buy from the, and then buy from the legal market. And again, I think we have to keep in mind that the DRA looked at the estimate based on flour at the $30. We are seeing in state um, flour actually decreasing and these um, concentrates and edibles increasing. And so if that's the case, then you're not really accounting for um, how much, much revenue you might lose because that, that product's taxed at a lower level. 
I won't um, go into too much about the seed to sale tracking mechanism, except to say I think it's really vital. Every single state that has legalized has it that. It's um, an audit tool, it's a safety tool. You can track it, um, make sure that um, money is not being diverted, as, as uh, the Department of Revenue said. Um, and I looked through this bill um, 20 times now, and I have seen nothing that says seed to sale tracking. I think what was brought up by Joe Hannon was really broad authority. Um, I saw something in there about record keeping requirements. If that's what it's meant to be, I think you need to be very clear that you need a seed to sale tracking program. Again, every state that legalized has it. Um, and I will just, won't spend a lot of time in this, but there are a lot of unintended costs that have been incurred by states that have legalized. Um, we, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons from the alcohol fund. 5% uh, of gross profits for liquor was supposed to go to prevention, treatment, and recovery. That really hasn't happened since uh, only one year that has happened. Um, so why would this be any different? We have a lot of um, concerns about that. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of questions we don't know. What we absolutely know for sure, that the cost of substance abuse has increased from 1.84 billion to 2.3 billion since 2014 in New Hampshire alone. Um, that accounts for 21,000 annually for each individual who is dependent on uh, abuses of alcohol or drugs. We have woefully underfunded prevention, treatment, and recovery in this state. Um, to what I spoke to before with the alcohol fund never being fully funded. And our state continues with the substance misuse epidemic. For these reasons, we need to do what's right for New Hampshire. We're in a situation where we can wait and see how this um, experiment uh, plays out in other states. We urge the committee to vote inexpedient to legislate. And I have um, left with you um, articles referring to uh, this discussion of taxing in different places, uh, plummeting the prices that have uh, plummeted in other states. There's an article about that, and also the importance of a fee to sell trucking program. I did want to say, too, um, just a note of the delivery when the sponsor was spoke, speaking about the delivery of products to her question. And if uh, he was referring to that would only be retail delivery, it very clearly says delivery to cannabis consumers. Um, I just flagged that because even though it's more of a policy issue, this has been controversial in other states because communities that have opted out um, now are um, delivery is being made to those communities. Some communities agree with that, some don't. So I just want to be clear that it does talk about cannabis delivery to the consumer. Could you tell us specifically where that part Yeah, it's in the regulations. Um, under the Cannabis Control Commission, and it's letter G. What page? Um, yeah. <coughs> Here it is. So it's page 10, line 21. Procedures for the delivery of cannabis to consumers. Line 21 and 22. Okay, that's a different section than the one that was being talked about. I was asking about that delivery before, so we have to try to Yeah, there's another the mention way. of delivery later, but this yeah. is where it defines who you can deliver to. Okay. Oh, okay. Website names? Yeah. Um, so the proposed tax in the bill is $30 per ounce of flowers. And uh, my, your comments on potency made me wonder about the flowers and variation mm -hmm. in potency. Uh, can you inform us a little yeah. bit on what's likely? I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. So the marijuana we may all know, or some of us may know of from 20 years ago, it's very different. It's that back then was three to five percent THC, which is um, the addictive component. Um, now on a legal market, it can be anywhere from 15 percent, almost as high as 98 mm percent. -hmm. Flour typically can be uh, 30 on the high range, maybe 15 to 30, 40 percent. These edible products or these waxes, dabs, and shatters, 
they are typically much higher potency um, from the 60 to the 98 percent. So we really, the bill really, the estimates are really based on the flower. What they're seeing in some states is the flower sales starts to go down, still about 50 percent, but these other products are increasing. So if that's the case, you'll have less revenue from flower. But nobody in this state, at least until it's legalized nationwide, and then this whole thing would have to be redone, on, on nobody in this state would be able to produce edibles except from these flowers that have been grown in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably correct, but the, the alternative treatment centers do that right now. If you look at the products available on the medical marijuana, they have um, concentrates in all of this. But what I'm saying is, like, it's, it's still, the tax to the consumer is less. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is that uh, that ounce of flowers for a buyer, for a buyer who's not a cultivator, um, could be worth a whole lot more because it could be more potent than another ounce of flowers. And yet we're going to be taxing flowers as well. I think that could be the case. I mean, it does have to state what the percentage is um, on that, but um, it's not very clear in the regulations how well that, that will be um, tested and verified. So I do, I agree with <coughs> that, that could be the point. Thank you. Okay, Representative Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Been old. I have no idea. You have a, a handout here. Mm -hmm. Looks like a petri dish, and it has uh, cannabis in it. Mm -hmm. What is that an ounce, or how much is uh, contained in the ounce? Um, I actually can't answer that. <laughs> What's in, the, in that? Um, I think um, it's probably about the same amount of I really don't know. I can't speak to what is in the picture, but I think you have to look closely at the idea that you can have home grow um, of up to 12 plants, which can generate uh, quite a bit. I'll talk. There might be others you can answer. <laughs> I think what you see in the I think what you see in the picture here is is a different. It's a store. You can see the 14.4 and the 14.9 percent. They're talking about the percent of THC in the product, I'm quite sure. And are so those flowers? Those are the flowers. Those are actually the flowers of marijuana. Yeah, but my question is, what's contained in one of those dishes that less than an ounce, more than an ounce? With well, less than an ounce. The an ounce, you know, an ounce is a lot. Because the flowers light. You know, no, I'm not saying that. No, it's a no, but the, it, but the reason the I asked that question, question, I want to find out how many people yeah. use it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really answer that question. Never mind. There's a question down here, Madam Chair. Yes, yes. Sorry about that. Madam Chair, thank you. And thank you for your testimony and for taking my question. Your, uh, your guidance on what's happened in other states, prices going down, potency going up. I think touches on a concern that some of my colleagues have expressed about whether or not this is a flexible enough um, regulatory structure to allow for competition. And it seems like what you're finding in other states is evidence of competition <coughs> in that prices are going down, quality as measured by potency has gone up. And that's, that's evidence of, of a good marketplace. And I think, so I'm wondering, do you, do you agree with that? And do you, do you think that that would then put more pressure on the black market to compete with the legal market? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, what other states have seen, and I mean, again, the black market really never goes away, but if you talk, you know, the, the black market will continue to try to undercut those prices. So I can't really answer whether or not that is your question about competition, but what you find is that the black market will still continue to undercut the price and, and be in business. I mean, that's what these states have experienced. Um, yes, uh, we just got another card that wants more than five minutes to speak. We are in desperate trouble. Um, if there are questions that can be delayed until the work session, please do it. 
Can I just ask her the question? Yes. She can give the an answer yes. offline. Uh, okay, so uh, New Futures has recommended ITL, and your statement is that you should do the right thing for New Hampshire. So I'm curious if there's something in this bill that New Futures supports. Otherwise, we're killing the whole thing and doing nothing. And yeah. it's hard to imagine doing nothing being the right thing. Right. I think this answer will cross a little bit into policy. I think there are major issues with the bill that we raised in the policy committee. So as it stands right now, we do, we are um, urging the committee to vote in expedient to legislate. We served on the study commission. Um, there were many uh, agreement, we had a lot of agreement with some of those recommendations. We felt it could go farther, like having limits on the product and potency. If people want to come to the table and have uh, a bill that reflects all sides, that is something we would be willing to discuss. So that is not in the current form. And I don't want to hear any more discussions like this <laughs> yeah. today. Thank you. That is for the policy and for that. the Senate at this point. So. Yes. Do you think, I don't know if everyone in the audience realizes that at one point we're going to leave, so was yes. it fair to them uh, to let them know? Uh, we have to leave without anything to eat, if necessary, for a se voting session which is going to start at 1 o'clock and go until 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night. So um, this is the ending point on this. This is why, why I'm really going to have to try to restrict people. Um, I'm calling Paul Morissette of Loudon, representing himself. You can't have five minutes. Could you take two? <laughs> Thank you. After waiting hours, I have, I have one, I have one, I have one I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, this is, and we went, we went to a three-hour hearing yesterday on the paper. It was supposed to be one hour. Thank you very much. And then had to take up another long bill. So um, we really uh, are stretched to the limit in this committee at this point, and we have a deadline that is such that we're not going to be able to get these things out. We're going to have to retain them if we don't have enough time. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll go as quickly as I can. My name is Paul Morissette. I'm a New Hampshire businessman, and I'm here to represent business, and I can answer a couple questions, especially that Representative Edwards had. Um, there's two portions of the proposed tax bill, 481, that's how, uh, how and how much we're going to tax it, and the second is how we split it up. I gave you a one-page handout here. I, I, I really don't understand how we've gotten taxed so far into this with the ta current tax structure. Um, what I did was I laid out for you what would happen if we charged a $30 tax at the cultivation level and a $30 tax if we taxed it at the retail level. And then I made some assumptions. Excuse me, there's nothing at the retail level. No, I, if, 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 if we tax $30 at the retail level as opposed to taxing it at the wholesale level. See, Madam Chairman, it's not just how much we're taxing, it's where we tax it. Because what happens as a businessman at the wholesale level is when, when, when you're selling this to the next tier, which presumably would be manufacturing, we're adding $30 tax into what, to a $62.50 an ounce cost. So basically, they're paying 92.50, and then they're going to start to compound the tax because they paid it. The tax becomes a cost of goods acquired, and when they pass it along to the next tier of distribution, they don't only mark up the cost from the cultivator; they mark up the tax. So what happens is, if you read and go through this, what happens is if you tax it at thirty dollars, which we don't, we don't, I don't agree with, but if you tax it at thirty dollars at the wholesale level, it ends up at the retail level being $240.25 per ounce, as opposed to taxing it $30 at the retail level, which doesn't compound, it ends up being $192.32. So not only do I disagree with the way we're taxing it, which should be a percentage, but, but the way we're, where we're taxing it, because it ends up at the end being a difference of $47.93 of extra tax added just because we're compounding the $30 tax. So when you add it together, that's a $77.93 uh, uh, tax on it. And what happens is when the price of this inevitably comes down, and you're a businessman with mil millions of dollars invested, we end up with an absurd amount of tax in the live free or die state that's going to 
promote the black market that's, that's going to kill business and put undue burden on consumers. And the other, things that, the other thing it does, uh, which is particularly offensive, is a $30 tax is per ounce. You just heard testimony. There's different levels. It's just like alcohol. You can have 40 proof alcohol gin cost $20 a bottle or $200 a bottle. And what happens is the, the, the lower end of our economic spectrum who will buy the lower end of the product ends up paying a disproportionate amount of tax because if you're buying my example on the bottom is if you buy a, put a $30 tax on a $200 uh, a per ounce cannabis, that's a 15% tax. But if you put it on a 400 ounce high, you know, high percentage um, better cannabis that's 400 an ounce, a $30 tax is only a 7.5% tax. So taxing it like this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And there's other, I, I don't have the time, there's a whole lot of other structural problems with it, but we suggest you tax it at 5% at the cultivation level, which takes into account that someday, very soon, we're going to be able to export this and the state's going to collect s some kind of tax that's going to offset what happens when the price drops. And then we suggest you tax it 10% at point of purchase, which ends up with the compound of the 5% being a 15.5% tax total. And that's what we consider the sweet pot spot, not being too high to promote the black market, but being low enough so businessmen like myself can invest into the market and not worry about today uh, when it sells I'm um, 20% or 30% tax and tomorrow when the price drops I'm 60 or 80% tax, which, I, which just doesn't work. And um, that's uh, as quick as I can go. And that's yeah, thank, thank you very much. Good job. Very um, good. When you were talking about setting the tax by the quality of it, you mean potency? Or well, there, there, there's several things that make it up, just like liquor. It doesn't necessarily mean that Bacardi 151 costs, costs more than, than something that's, that's less of a proof. That's one of the things that goes in. But generally speaking, if you tax it at a point of purchase, which we don't like to do in New Hampshire, but if you tax it at a point of purchase, it takes into account all of that because a better quality product, just like cars or alcohol or whatever you buy, if it's taxed on a percentage, the tax gets adjusted based, you know, based on what the product sells for. It just seems to me that's the, uh, the quickest, the, the, the easiest, simplest, fairest way to tax it and, and a way that business can promote this and we don't have to worry about you know, the state having their cake and eating it too, carrying a $30 tax ahead. It's just like the projections that Kate was saying. We see projections that this isn't going to drop 58%, it's going to drop 75%. So when that does that, you know, and we have to somehow go back to the legislature, the Cannabis Commission, to change the tax at that point and say, hey, you're not going to collect 60 million, we really only need to collect 30. I've seen those kind of arguments in this state. We go forward with more tax, but we never seem to go backwards. So I think we do it right in the beginning. We tax it on percentages. It, it takes into account everything. And it's true the state's going to have to collect tax for more people. But how many people do we collect alcohol tax on? Every restaurant that has alcohol, every general store, every supermarket. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's very simple to do. That's, what a, that's all I have to say. <coughs> I think you flew by somewhere in there. Well, I was told to. I'm an auctioneer, by the way, by yeah. trade. So that. <laughs> uh, How much do you want? Uh, well, the uh, the uh, taxing at call it the wholesale level, the cultivator level, um, means that <coughs> if the federal rule changes and this becomes an interstate system, that that tax doesn't work. Uh, well, yeah, is that correct? The, the currently proposed tax is thirty dollars an ounce. I mean, you guys don't understand. That's a four hundred eighty dollar pound. We think we could produce it for less than that. No, my so point is that it, that tax applies to cultivators, and we can only level that, levy that on cultivators within the state. The five percent you're talking about, or the thirty dollars an ounce? The, th the thirty dollars an ounce is a disaster for uh, for get for out of state because we, we couldn't even compete if we carried a thirty dollar tax and I tried to sell it into Colorado and Massachusetts where the taxes aren't near that high when the pr it, it, it's it's an impossible burden. Yeah. You know I that's the tax was higher, but anyway. Um, 
Thank you. I think um, that's all we can do right now. We've got to get to a lot of other people. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank question you. question Thank for you. the chair. Could you repeat his name? It's not on the... Yeah, uh, uh, my name is Paul Morissette. M-O-R-R-I-S-S-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. You want my contact? Um, Cell number? And I can answer a lot more questions for you about the business side of it. And we Thank can you. get Thank these you. from the clerk's notes and because he's taking them down unless they're illegible. Right. On Commissioner Jasper uh, for the Department of Agriculture opposing Section 7 of the bill. I don't know if you could speak quicker than three to five minutes. But I, I certainly will, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I am Sean Jasper, Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. And it's a pleasure to, to be here where I served three terms when I was a member of, of the House on this committee. Um, and I owe you two apologies. The first is that I was not able to be here when we uh, were before you a couple of weeks ago. I was not able to be here, and I wouldn't have missed that opportunity had I been able to be here. And the second is, that I am here at all today. Um, we were told that this section, section seven, was going to be removed in the policy committee. Um, and so we did not testify there on the assurance that it was going to be. Excuse me, the Cannabis Control Commission was going to be removed? No, 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 no. Yeah. Section, section seven, seven is seven. Hemp, oh, page oh, 18. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at F7, page yeah. 18. No, page 18 of your bill. Um, this is really an issue that is covered in House Bill, did I just do it one? Uh, House Bill 459, uh, which even the uh, sponsor of that bill recognized was not ready for prime time. And he introduced the amendment, which turned it into a study committee with a report due on November 1st dealing with the issue of hemp. The real problem uh, with this uh, section of the bill is that it actually puts my department in, at odds with federal law and it requires me to do things without an appropriation to do them so I would be unable to do them and um, there's no fee involved at all so um, that's why it is appropriate for you to take it out because um, no money I wouldn't be able to do the job and I'd be violating Federal bill, I, uh, federal law. I can go into the details of that, but I don't think you need me to. And I would just ask that you remove Section Seven from the bill. Thank you. I, I remember that from when we uh, went through this exercise six years ago. I think it was um, that the Department of Agriculture uh, would have to hire extra people <coughs> and not use its normal people to violate federal law. Well, yeah. States like Vermont are already growing hemp because under the 2014 Farm Bill, there were provisions to submit a state plan and to do it under research but potential or whatever. We put that into the law. Uh, we have a section of law doing that. No research has been done, but now we need a state plan. So every state that is not already doing it needs a state plan. That takes time. There's no time to do the rules. It, this is just a mess for us. Okay, um, Rich Knox or Noise of uh, Concord representing himself supporting the bill, please not for five minutes. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Representative. My name is Rich Knox. I'm, I'm one of the primary cannabis activists and I represent myself and a lot of the citizens. Huh? the tens of thousands of them that follow me in social media and throughout the works that I've done through the medical program and decriminalization now this house bill. Um, I agree with a lot of the bill, uh, most, of, most of it. I, I have to agree with Mr. Morissette, though, regarding the taxation. And uh, the numbers that uh, Ms. Gray was using were a bit excused, um, skewed. Um, we have talked about the concentrates in cannabis and so on and so forth for, for, for years now. And I think we've come to find it's like a cocktail or a beer or wine. We're not going to sit down and drink a whole bottle. And if you are, you have a serious problem, you need help. Uh, most of us, like myself, I, I've been consuming cannabis for 40 years. And uh, I, I do enjoy flour. 
Uh, but there are times, uh, because I'm a medical patient, that my pains and my neuropathy and swellings that, I, that occur, I use a concentrate. Now, I don't smoke the whole gram or the whole um, portion that I get. Nice. But it does, yeah. You're I'm reflecting on some of the things that. that were said here so that we can clarify a lot of the misshaping that's going on. Okay, I think it's very important for us to understand that. I, I know you're kind of disgruntled and we went very far on to this. It's a yeah. question of disgruntled, I'm sorry, but we, we, you look it. we have to leave by 10 minutes to, to 1. There is no alternative for us. Okay, I don't know what alternative we're going to have to rectify the tax portion of this bill. I spent an entire year with uh, Representative Barami as our state's expert. And I, we got to hear a lot about from a lot of different states and the problems that they had. But the plan that we put together was quite frankly, from based on the states and other professionals within the industry, is quite frankly one of the best ones that have come up. Uh, we've learned our lessons and mistakes from other states. Uh, not, not only that, we've waited so long to get involved into the industry that we're surrounded by a black market influx. We talk about problems that we have in our state faced with drug epidemics and problems that are created by the medical community. But what we've done by not allowing legalization is to continue to foster <coughs> illicit drugs and drugs that aren't cannabis. And by allowing cannabis to be legalized and marketing it and taxing it in a proper manner, it allows citizens, like Joanna said, it'll come out of their closet. Uh, the numbers that are in this form, about the 130,000, the, the assumptions that were made there, and because I am a leader in that industry, are very wrong and very low, quite frankly. We, we kind of snicker about those numbers because we already know. So you agree with uh, I agree with the bill. Mr. Morissette. Oh, I do. Absolutely. And you'd like to change the parts about the taxation? And do you have time uh, to come to the subcommittee that will be meeting on Friday morning? I do. And I'd like to also bring some of the uh, reports that were asked for. Uh, myself and some of our staff will be happy to put together a number of different reports regarding consumptionary, a number of different ones that we'd like to provide for you from the information that we heard today and we recorded so that you can get a better idea. Uh, because what we keep getting is outdated information, uh, biased information from departments and industry, but not in the cannabis arena, and not one person in the room is a cannabis industry professional that's in this other than myself, Paul, Matt is a yes. lobbyist. So there are very few in here that can actually tell you how we go about doing this and we do right. it the right way. We and I'd like to bring you that those subcommittee. Records. We are going to have a subcommittee that okay. starts meeting Friday morning. Okay. Um, at the rate we're going, I'm not going to be able to get things posted in time. Uh, not this Friday morning, but next Friday morning. Okay, so okay, next Friday morning. 10 yeah. o'clock, same time? <coughs> the 22nd, correct? Well, that that be, yeah, it'll be canceled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll I'll be sure to bring you some data and some information. That today. will be posted. <coughs> it will be only able to get in the calendar by by Thursday night, the okay. night before Friday morning. Okay. So it'll be the following week. It will, it will be the following week, but it will Thank be. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your time, and we'll bring those yeah. information. I, I really am sorry. Yeah, current ones. Current, yeah. current information. We're trying to figure out at this point where we can get information that we need to. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, John Birfonsky, Chief of Police of Bedford, representing the New Hampshire Chiefs of Association of Chiefs of Police, on opposing the bill on revenue cost for cost issues. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good morning. Well, good afternoon, now, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm John Birfonsky, and here representing the uh, Chiefs Association for New Hampshire. 40 years in law enforcement, almost eight years, eight years as chief here. We are opposed to this bill for a variety of reasons, but also to talk about the revenue side of this, we believe and we're confident that the amount of revenue, which is grossly over-exaggerated and overestimated in, in all the states that have legalized marijuana so far, has fallen short um, in its ability to develop enough uh, cash and revenue to support regulation as well as enforcement. Rather than go into all the, all the details, I know that you're just slow up. I can't hear it. Okay. It was so fast, I can't hear what you said. Well, I know you're pressed for time, so I know, I know that the yeah, chairman yeah. is trying to move along. Right. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bypass a lot of the facts that, that are in the handout. You can read those yourself. 
Uh, there's a lot of dispute um, across the nation about a lot of a lot of the facts that are out there. But one thing that is well settled, and that is the fact that revenue derived from taxes, licenses, and fees of legalized marijuana in states where it has been legalized has fallen short. The Vermont's uh, deputy tax um, uh, commissioner just recently said that the expected windfall is not happening in Vermont. Uh, Alaska, who's taxing it at a higher rate than New Hampshire is anticipating taxing it, is not making any money on it. California's recent current year tax revenues have fallen short by $160 million. They recently, just a few weeks ago, introduced legislation to reduce the taxes on marijuana in California. And the reason why is because the black market can always and always will undercut legalized products. Uh, if there's one thing that I can tell you about an expert in the cannabis industry, well, there's another one in here because I've been at it for 40 years, uh, both with 27 with DEA, and I can tell you that drug trafficking organizations can produce marijuana for pennies on the pound, as opposed to what the legalized um, industry will do. And if they want to devastate a legalized industry, they can do that very, very simply. Um, gray market and black market has flourished absolutely in all these states where it's been legalized. It hasn't gone away and it's gotten larger. Why? Because they're going to compete. And they're going to compete with you uh, on, with legalized marijuana and they're always going to be able to undercut and undersell you for all the good reasons that you're already aware of. So uh, taxing at $30 an ounce, taxing at $20 an ounce, uh, still uh, makes no difference to illegal drug trafficking organizations. They don't have to worry about washing the money in the federal banking system because it doesn't go there. So um, when we talk about revenue, just one final piece, the Department of Revenue talks about two million alone in New Hampshire just to uh, stand up the Department of Revenue side of the enforcement. We haven't even begun to talk about what the numbers are to, uh, for the cost of enforcement. If you want to drive the black market or keep it down to the point where it can't compete with legalized marijuana, it's going to cost a lot of money. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that we don't have the capacity and the funds to deal with the current drug crisis, let alone another drug crisis that'll be uh, fostered if we have to deal with this particular problem. Thank you. Uh, Representative Major Lee Pat, or you didn't. Uh, Representative Bursting. Yeah, your assertion that black markets will always undercut legalized industries. How bad is your problem of dealing with the black market with alcohol? Because there, there is no black market co competition for alcohol. There never has been. There never will be. You can grow marijuana in the plant with absolutely no, um, no chemical or plant experience. Uh, whipping up a, bat a batch of beer or alcohol or wine, that's a different story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I try to get the question to you in advance. I don't know if it made its way. But, uh, what, what I'm what I'm curious about is the the delta between the cost of law enforcement the law enforcement over the next five years without the law and the cost of law enforcement over five years with the law. I'm I'm just because I, I don't understand what how much we're going to have to spend on law enforcement. We're going to have to spend money on law enforcement in either way, whether there's strict black market or whether there, we try to legalize and I. I, you're talking about revenues. I, I need to know what the costs are of law enforcement. Well, just uh, and, and the problem of it is, is that you're not alone. Nobody really knows the answer to those numbers. That's why we believe it's good to look at and wait for these other states to build up some, our colleagues and other states where it's legalized, to build up some reliable numbers in terms of cost. We'll just take, um, there's a machine that uh, California uses now, uh, San Diego Police Department, I read a recent report from them that they use for roadside impairment testing. That machine costs $6,000 a copy. Um, much like uh, an intoxilizer, but it's not the same. Well, if you multiply that times 100 police departments in New Hampshire, you're at $6 million before you get out of the gate. And that's on top of the $2 million from the Department of Revenue. That's not talking about the cost of training, recruiting, putting additional police officers out there to deal with it. So we don't know what the numbers are, and I wish I could tell you what the numbers would be, but it's a lot larger than what the revenues have been in the other state. Thank you for your service. Thanks for everything you're doing to help keep us safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I call Matt, Matt Simon, uh, representing the marijuana policy project, and supporting the
bill of written testimony. I hope we can summarize really quickly. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee. Matt Simon of Manchester, representing the Marijuana Policy Project. I'll be as brief as I can. I'm passing around the handout. It's about 11 pages of information. I'm not going to read any of it. It is uh, all of the states that have programs up and running, the financial information from those states, including taxes, licensing, and fees. And I believe that information tells its own story in, in the states that do have established markets. Uh, they are raising substantial revenue. So revenue is not the main point of this bill. I think the main point of this bill is to divert illicit activity, to divert hundreds of millions of dollars from an illegal market into a regulated market. But it will produce substantial revenue, and that's the handout. I'm going to use my limited time responding to just a few questions that came up. First, dealing with banking issues. So we've heard it sounds like it's going to be an all-cash economy, and that's really not the case, certainly not in Massachusetts. Uh, there are hundreds of banks <coughs> that are serving the adult use cannabis businesses that exist. Uh, there was an article recently from Massachusetts, the chairman of the Control Commission, Stephen Hoffman, says he's comfortable with the access retailers have to banking. The article says two Massachusetts banks, uh, GFA Federal Credit Union and Bay Coast Bank, have begun to work with marijuana businesses, and the third bank, which is asked not to be identified, is also serving marijuana businesses. The chairman says, quote, I'm reasonably comfortable. We're bringing in banks at a pace that's consistent, the pace at which we're opening. The current licensees that are operational, I believe, are all banked. So I think it's very unlikely that we're going to be talking about all cash businesses in New Hampshire. There is a bill in Congress that was just reintroduced that has 108 sponsors aiming to fix this federally, which we all agree I think should happen. But in the meantime, banks are serving these businesses. And, uh, less so in places like California where it is still the Wild West, but in places that have had regulated systems all along, it's less of an issue. Um, on the seed sale question, I think uh, it's worth glancing at that. So it starts on page seven, but really on page nine is where you see a section called Regulation of Cannabis. And it does go into a great amount of detail. <coughs> It does not mandate explicitly the seed to sale tracking. So uh, on page 10, there are a number of items that are the commission's supposed to are create. Are talking about the bill? The bill itself, page 10. And, uh, right, so it mandates record keeping requirements for cannabis establishments. It mandates requirements for the transportation of cannabis to cannabis establishments, including documentation, procedures, procedures, procedures. It appears to me that the authority exists for them to mandate a seed seal system if they believe that's appropriate. And if it needs to be more explicit, that would be fine with me. I just, I, I believe it's already there. The, the commission already has broad authority to create rules to prevent diversion. And it simply stops short of spelling out that it has to be a seed to sale system. That's just my opinion. We've heard that the illicit market can simply reduce its prices to adjust to whatever the retail stores are doing. To me, from an economic perspective, that makes about as much sense as say, Montgomery Ward and Sears don't really have anything to fear from Walmart. They can just cut their prices to further below Walmart. Uh, what we have seen is really the opposite. So there's a report published uh, by the state of Colorado, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, last year uh, that indicates the illicit market has largely been eliminated in Colorado. Uh, a quote from that report, I'll send you a link, but it says, the results of the study indicate that the illicit market for resident and visitor marijuana has been largely, if not entirely, absorbed into the legal market where it is regulated and taxed for the protection of public health and safety. It took several years for that to happen. At first, the prices were high, even somewhat higher than the illicit market price. It was a matter of supply and demand, plus taxes. Uh, the effective tax rate in Colorado is much higher than is being proposed here. Uh, but even in Colorado, with its much higher tax than what we're proposing, uh, the prices 
have fallen dramatically, as escape from your future said. So it's, to the extent there's illicit market activity, it is criminal actors who are moving to Colorado, potentially buying houses in Colorado, growing them full of marijuana, believing they can evade detection, and then shipping it to states new, like New Hampshire where you can still sell it for 350 bucks an ounce, as opposed to the 200 bucks or whatever it is in the stores in Colorado. So there is still illicit market activity. I think it's completely misleading to suggest that Coloradans in, in, in mass are still buying from drug dealers. Six billion dollars worth of cannabis has been sold through the retail system in Colorado since 2014. We're also not talking about other taxes, but I think it's worth noting there was a report published last week that says 211,000 jobs have been created nationwide by the legal cannabis industry. Those are all going to have an, a tax in, impact uh, of, of some kind. Finally, as to what we can expect in terms of usage rates, I think one of the better sources would be Governor Hickenlooper, former Governor Hickenlooper, who's now running for president, he was in New Hampshire a couple weeks ago and on WMUR, he said, uh, we're about five into it, years into it and the initial fears haven't happened. We haven't seen a spike in teenage consumption. We haven't seen a spike in any consumption except senior citizens. So there's been a very modest increase among adults 21 to, to 50 or whatever, a more substantial increase among senior citizens who are anecdotally substituting cannabis for prescription drugs and alcohol. And there's actually been a, a modest decrease in teen consumption, which was, I believe, the number one concern people had. So I'm agnostic as to what the tax structure and tax rate should be. I think what is being proposed here is reasonable. I think we should not tax, I certainly agree with the study commission that it should not be a goal of the policy to, to produce revenue at the expense of eliminating the illicit market. So what are other states doing around us? I think that is relevant. In Massachusetts, it's a total possible tax rate of 20%. So 10.25% retail tax plus the usual 6.75% sales tax and a 3% local option tax. So it should, could be up to 20% in Massachusetts. Uh, in Maine, they have a tax at two levels. It's uh, a cultivation tax that is... Uh, it's, yes, you do. Uh, they have a cultivation tax that is also by weight, but it's by pound. So I think it's 335 bucks per pound at the cultivation level and then a 10% retail tax. And I'm not a mathematician. They tell me that comes out to roughly 20% at the point of sale, similar to what Massachusetts had. My friends in the Vermont Senate two weeks ago passed a bill uh, that has a tax rate of 16% and a 2% local option. So they wanted to be a little bit under Massachusetts, and they are. I would suggest that we should not be more than neighboring states. And whether it's per ounce or uh, a percentage-based tax, I am agnostic. I know you all want to eat lunch, so I don't want to keep talking. I wanted to respond to some of the main no, points. I'll follow up with you. We're un highly unlikely to be able to get lunch unless we brought it with us and we eat it on the way over. Yes. Uh, in the aggregate, of all the states that are uh, doing legal uh, marijuana right now, cannabis, um, what, what, how many of them do you think are executing their tax policy specifically to avoid creating a black market? I think it's part of the discussion everywhere. Uh, I think when people first come to this issue, there's often a, a sense of, well, marijuana is bad, but if we tax the hell out of it, that's good, and we can offset the bad. I think the more people learn about this, the more they come to the position that overtaxing is a negative that the main policy goal should be to create a market that's accessible, that people want to choose, and that will they will choose, uh, you know, given we know they can still meet up with the drug dealer they've been buying from for 10 or 20 years. And from my perspective, the evidence is overwhelming. People will choose the regulated market if it's available. They don't have to drive an hour to get to it, or if there's a delivery option, or as long as the prices aren't astronomically higher, people will pay a premium to have a product that's been tested, that isn't covered with mold, pesticide, heavy metals, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Major John Montarcel, are you still here? You left? Also opposing the bill. Uh, 
Ross Connolly of Merrimack representing AFP. Yep, just in uh, respect of your time, and I hope all the members can get lunch. I'm just submitting written that testimony. Today, Thank so you. Does I'll it say what AFP is? Americans for Prosperity. Oh. Uh -huh. It's called K O C A. For or against, Ross? For. I'll be at the subcommittee if you have any questions on that. Okay. Uh, Daniel Broussard of Concord, New Hampshire, representing CHS. Is that Concord High School? Yeah, I was the president, five. president of the graduating class 2005. Oh, okay. Uh, supporting the bill. I am. Um, I just kind of want to open myself up to questions for the committee. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Concord. Um, I'm like a seventh generation American. I tracked my uh, descent, my uh, um, grandfather's grandfather's grandfather who moved from London uh, to the um, U.S. before it was. Um, I've uh, sampled adult use cannabis in uh, the country of uh, the Netherlands. Um, I've been to dispensary in Amsterdam um, and went Colorado uh, took a chance to uh, recreationally legalize and I drove all the way from here to Colorado to try out um, uh, legal purchasable uh, cannabis products. Um, uh, during my undergraduate study in uh, greater DC I discussed uh, openly my experience at Concord High School as a student in the state. Um, where I would describe uh, access to cannabis products being easier to acquire than alcohol. Um, and uh, when I spoke with friends that I'd made in the greater DC area, uh, they described, uh, they were able to reference uh, my experience and say that like the um, price as a youth in the state was cheaper than any price for uh, cannabis products that he had ever heard of anywhere else in the country. Um, at, the, at, at retail and at wholesale levels. Um, the projections in the DRA about uh, revenue to me seem uh, grossly underestimated. They read to me more like the kind of revenue that one dispensary makes in one month. We heard that figure about um, nearly $6 billion in Colorado in the course of four years. And to, to talk about $20 million is what one of these businesses sometimes makes in a month, um, particularly if you can compete with the price of the surrounding uh, markets, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, and Vermont. Um, I think that the Speedway coming to Loudoun is uh, definitely going to be a, probably a greater contributor, uh, and the, and the, uh, the music festival that's coming to the Speedway, probably a greater contributor by quantity than that DRA projection says for people who uh, purchase from out of state, like 1,500 people or something like that. I think 1,500 people who come to that music festival probably would purchase our in-state uh, cannabis. Um, the, um, uh, recent uh, uh, development in this market, although it is a black market, um, when uh, Bitcoin was popularized not very long ago and the Silk Road website and the Darknet uh, materialized, um, that uh, market shined a light effectively on what the price in the black market was. And uh, the chief of police who uh, uh, came up here uh, grossly exaggerated um, uh, black market wholesale prices. Pennies on the pound, is uh, that's just downright untrue. Um, the actual uh, value of uh, a cannabis gram becomes about pennies. You can you can purchase a gram at around 13 cents per gram in the um, Silk Road Bitcoin market, and uh, that expands out. You know, uh, so uh, what I wonder about historically from our state is how did we transition from uh, what Cushing uh, said before uh, the floor about driving to uh, uh, a place in Hampton to get prescription alcohol during uh, prohibition. What I wonder is how did we go from where you would go to get prescription alcohol, uh, where we now have prescription cannabis, uh, and how did the regulatory model move to change to create the state liquor stores <coughs> from having previously had prescription only alcohol? Because that seems like the model. And if this bill, uh, as much as I support this bill, if this bill isn't helping to do that, uh, then I, I might rescind my support. Um, I would say uh, uh, J the Japanese have the best vending machines in the world, and although California uh, tried and failed at creating a cannabis dispensary vending machine for uh, their medical patients because people would like hold up someone who used them at armed uh, by the time they walked like down the block 
they were getting robbed for using the cannabis dispensaries um, that were in vending machines. I think that because of the unique relationship that New Hampshire shares with um, the nation of Japan and the signing of the Russo-Japanese War in Portsmouth, um, that we should really be reaching out to some uh, Japanese engineers to get us a identity verifying and um, safely distributing uh, just ter terminal, a box uh, that stands upright, that looks at you, knows who you are, and then gives you your products. Um, and uh, in my personal view, um, cannabis is uh, probably older than the human species and is a religious sacrament. Um, and uh, the um, laws that govern the practices surrounding it are generally objectionable to me, but I really like the sound of uh, this bill so far as much as I've read it, and uh, I'd like to open myself to questions if you have any. But thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Yes, thank you. One quick question, Matt. How much does an ounce cost or a, a carton of joints cost on the corner? Uh, an ounce of pot uh, has uh, a retail sale price probably in like around here, around 200 to 220 dollars. That's what I would guess. Like right, 240, maybe maybe 10 dollars a gram. Oh, well, that's, yeah. that's fine. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to testify for or against? Oh, Just did not real quick, I didn't know I did not sign a paper. I you you have to fill in a card. You can do it afterwards. Yes. But you'll have to give us your name first. Yes. Your... Got it. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Michael Bisson. Michael Bisson. Yes, life, lifelong New Hampshire resident. Traveled around the country and seen all the other systems that are in play. Um, what uh, my concern is that we need to be able to have the atypical graft and dirt farmer find a way up into this system. What I see is that we need to charge this, we need to charge that, and charge this. Somebody in Grafton is going to have a yard sale, they're going to get 10 bucks. From that, they're going to try to move forward to be able to have their four plants to be able to do at the farmer's market, to eventually be able to sell to the store downtown. So please include a pathway for the New Hampshire dirt farmer who has absolutely nothing and can work their way up. Many people are literally living on scraps in the state. So they're not going to be going down and buying a lot of taxable product. They may be able to grow their personal use, but they could turn that into a business if you just leave a pathway for them. And that's all I'm asking for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. On, on the blue sheet, we have uh, five people who signed in against. Uh, someone from DHHS, Dan, who I don't know what his position is there, on, on Major Encarnacion, who didn't stay from the New Hampshire State Police, Dan Goodman of the AAA on Neil Hubanker of, of uh, Cornerstone and Jim Potter of the New Hampshire Medical Society. Signing in <coughs> for uh, Jason Powers of Concord for himself on Renick Naya. Oh, I think, I think he was, he testified. He did testify. Renick Naya. So on um, Bill Alleman of Ware for himself uh, and Paul Toomey who left us some testimony yeah. written uh, for himself. So, um, oh, and I missed Mrs. Jean Ruska, so I, I didn't mention her in the ACLU. So, so I am Closing the hearing on HB 481. Uh, as I said, thank you very much. As I said,